This is not the answer I expected. I don't even know exactly what it is that I was expecting, but I know that it was not this. The false sun god has been unmasked, and it turns out we've actually met this man before, several times before actually. He's been in a cover story, he was actually in the Whole Cake Island arc, and it's even implied that he may have been involved during the Egghead Island arc. So he's much more familiar than you may initially think, and we'll dive into this man and why he's doing all of these terrible, terrible things. But we have to start with the cover story, because this was just adorable seeing Tama training to become the bewitching Kunoichi that Ace inspired her to be. And you can see that she's training quite hard because she's covered in bandages and band-aids. But what I love most about this is the location. We are in Amigasa Village. And that is such a, such a hard hit of nostalgia because it's the first proper Wano location that we got to explore. And I really am starting to feel quite fond of the old Wano, because it was six years ago that we first discovered this lovely little village, and it's definitely taken a while, but I think I'm finally gearing up to properly reread Wano. I've been back to certain parts of it quite frequently, but going through the whole thing in one go, it's just, uh. After spending four years on Wano, I really feel like I needed to leave that behind for a bit, but I think it's finally time. And I loved seeing Tama here because this is my personal theory for the end of One Piece. Luffy's gonna become the Pirate King, initiate whatever the dawn of the world is, achieve his true dream and then vanish. Whether that's because he dies in some sort of will of D manner, or whether he does something like disappear into the unknown on an endless adventure. Either way, I think he's gonna have a Roger style influence on those who remain, and specifically the kids that he's met and inspired over the course of One Piece. And we're gonna see all of these kids having grown up and embarking on their own adventures, getting to see the world and becoming the protagonist of their own stories that we'll never see. So this cover page is a glimpse into the future of that world. Someday Tama will be a world renowned name. Back to matters at hand though, this is starting to become a bit of a joke now, but Yamato still hasn't started investigating the little issue of all of the missing people. In fact, no one has, not even Ino Arashi, the daimyo of Kuri seems to care. So maybe we'll get some sort of Yamato Tama team up to solve this here mystery, or maybe we'll just keep ignoring it until they abduct someone important. And even then, I don't know, because we've got delicious food to eat, priorities, mate. Although speaking of eating, I don't mean to sound rude, but did you notice that Shinobu is a little bit different on this cover? Potentially due to indulging in a little bit too much Wano cuisine. I think a lot of people are going to forget this, but after the fight with Green Bull, Shinobu became really thin because he drained all of her body fat, or whatever the explanation was. But on this cover page, she's back to her larger design. And I do think that this may potentially be an error because in chapter 1115, we cut to Wano during the Egghead Island message and we see both Shinobu and Tama with Shinobu still very much in thin mode, which also brings up the question of exactly where in the timeline these Yamato events take place because we now have Tama and Shinobu both in the flower capital and in Amigasa village. So I don't know, this one's not as bad as all of the art errors in the first Legoland chapter, and it will probably be explained that Shinobu preferred her larger form, or that she ate a very big breakfast that morning in an SBS segment down the line, but it could feasibly be Oda simply forgetting what he did with her. The dude has over a thousand characters to manage, so I guess that happens from time to time, or even with old characters, especially when starting new arcs apparently. I maintain that the best part of One Piece is experiencing a thrill of adventure from the comfort of your own living situation. Stepping into the complete unknown at the beginning of every arc and being blown away by whatever the crap it is that Oda sees fit to include in his fictional pirate world. And after you're done with the chapter, you can step into a new fictional pirate adventure with the sponsor of this video, Sea of Conquest. A charming and immersive game where you can sail the seas with your mobile base, assemble your own crew, be your own Luffy, and challenge the world to become a king of the pirates. What's better is that Sea of Conquest throws you more into the role of an emperor of the sea. There's a lot of great empire management and a ton of in-world mysteries to solve in order to uncover glorious hidden treasures. Along the way, you will face trials and battles and even craft your own majestic flagship that would make the thousand sunny jealous. And not only that, but the Sea of Conquest universe also has its own comic cradle of the gods where our protagonists are working to make their dreams come true. But look, there's a bit of a twist in this world that I don't want to spoil. Let's just say that you need to be very careful about what you wish for. This is a game crafted for fictional pirate fans, so you can and should download it through my link in the description or by scanning the QR code on screen because mate, this is the call to adventure. And if you don't pick it up, it's not calling back. Adventure is busy. It's got better things to do than to wait for you. So don't miss it. Definitely check out Sea of Conquest. But for now, it's back to you, me 
All right, the first thing that we need to mention about this chapter proper is of course high heels. I got a couple of comments in last week's video stating that I should not have assumed that the sun god was a woman just because of the heels, and those comments were correct. Because we've rather easily, and without any actual effort, unmasked the false sun god in this chapter, and it was Rode, whose official English name is Rodo. I'm not entirely sure why, because it's the same spelling as the katakana would be for saying the English word Rode, and it's the exact same way that the word Rode in Rode Poneglyph is spelt in Japanese, katakana and all. So I don't know what happened there, but as a result, most people just call him Rode. I mean, I say most people, Let, let's be clear here. Most people have never had a reason to bring Rode up in discussion, much less try and figure out how his name is actually said. However, you may remember, but probably don't remember, that he was one of the new giant warrior pirates led by Haradin. The reason why you may not remember them is because Rode was introduced in the Grand Fleet cover story, because these guys have been in the actual manga, but in very cameo appearances. You can actually see the new giant warrior pirates in Vegapunk's flash back, salvaging all of the books on Ohara, although you cannot see Rode there. As far as I'm aware, it's just Haradin, Gerd, and Goldberg, although Rode could have feasibly been on the island as well. But Rode actually makes his first appearance in the series as a baby during Big Mom's flashback, and he was actually shown in the anime. However, he appears by name only in the manga. And they mention that Rode was born at roughly the same time as Prince Loki. So I wonder if there's any significance to them being born in the same year. Maybe Loki is a classic hero monarch that we need to help, and Rode is like the Draco Malfoy to his Harry Potter. But when we cut to Rode's only proper appearance in the manga, which is the cover story, and scan down, our boy has those sweet, sweet high heels, which I think of everyone teching actually predicted, so good on him. But all of that was a very roundabout way of saying that I will never make assumptions about high heels again. It is definitely surprising the way that this revelation happens though. Usually Oda reveals the answers to these masked and silhouetted figures in a bit more dramatically. Instead, we cut to a very basic flashback with the answer that Rode's bird friend picked up the sunny and brought it to what I think, or at the very least I hope, is actually Alboff. But I'm not a huge fan of what happened here. The whole idea that the ship went through this new sleep mist area that we never got to see. Because even after getting completely smashed, you would think that the giants would know to avoid this sort of area. And in the end, it sounds again like a lame setup for a filler arc. And you know what? It was exactly that with the rainbow mist filler arc. I'm a bit conflicted here because I do really like how this arc began with Nami simply waking up in a strange world and using that as a vehicle to get our first steps onto the island. Dealing with something manageable to human scale and then expanding outwards. But I do think that how we got to this point is a bit weak and it feels like flailing for narrative excuses, bringing in both the green fairy and the sleeping mist into it. It feels that one step too convoluted. So this is not Oda's best transitional work in my opinion, but he is setting up what looks like could be the heart of the Alboff conflict. Because in this chapter, Rode goes on a bit of a Hody Jones Arlong-esque rant about the superiority of giants and his general disgust at the idea of being a subordinate of a mere human, yuck. If I'm gonna be a subordinate of a human, at least make it a clown. And this has made me think that we've been quite lucky when it's come to meeting giants. We have Dory, Brogi, Oimokashi, Harudin, in fact, you know what, add Soul to the giant pile as well. They've all been quite down to earth, which is very impressive because they're so high up. But something I really loved about Dory and Brogi in particular on Little Garden is that they were not at all dismissive of the Straw Hats. There was nothing even approaching a sense of racial disparity. All there was was the recognition of fellow warriors and travelers. There was a point where Dory even asked Luffy if he wanted to fight for the eternal pose to Elbaf. And he didn't do that as a joke, he did it as a show of respect to Luffy and as a show of humbleness of Dory. They were even showing respect to Usopp. So even though the Elbaf culture does focus greatly on personal strength, it seems that most of the giants don't let that personal strength go to their heads. Now it should be said that all of these have been older giants from the era over a century ago, and attitudes may have changed as we see with Rode, because I highly doubt that he's the only giant that feels this way. He's just the first to make him himself known to us. So Elbaf looks like it could be split down the middle in regards to human sentiment. Because we have also seen a lot of giants who were happy to spend time with Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates. It wasn't just the old giant warrior pirates, but historically we do know that there have been tensions between giants and humans and getting involved with humans rarely seems to end well for them. I imagine there's also quite a bit of lingering resentment there. The fact that these tiny, fragile, itty bitty beings are in charge of the world and keeping us giant folk isolated in our territory. Like the fishmen being kept underwater. So even though he is a member of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, I don't know if Rode is necessarily going to end up as our ally here, if only because it seems difficult for him to narratively recover from this position, because he's doing some pretty messed up stuff. At this point, it would be kind of like adding Absalom to the Grand Fleet, if he was alive. But if he was alive and we added him, uh. But also throughout this chapter, Oda portrays Rode as quite deranged. And I don't know how this is gonna be done in the official translation, this is gonna be interesting actually. But Rode addresses the Straw Hats with an honorific that we don't often see 
in anything being tasso. Now I wasn't familiar with this term before looking into it for this chapter, but this is apparently a suffix widely used in otaku culture, specifically in regards to someone's oshi, meaning a person that they support or a person they're a big fan of. Like how Bartolomeo is a big fan of Luffy and the Straw Hats, but even then he addresses the crew as senpai instead of tasso. Tasso is also used for almost exclusively female characters, celebrities, idols, etc. So the use of this word is basically telling us that Road is going to be a degree creepier than Bartolomeo was, which we definitely see in regards to Nami, because as much as Road looks down on the weak, fragile bodies of the male Straw Hat members, he happens to be very impressed with Nami's body. And for me personally, I think this is going to be difficult for him to come back from, because the idea is not only that he drugged and stripped Nami, but also that he very much enjoyed doing it. What I can't quite figure out is if Oda is trying to play Road as creepy or play it as a gag, because I could see it going either way. Because Oda does use this as an excuse to draw a really funny Sanji face. And it's not as if Nami's bothered by any of this, although historically she's quite unfazed by stuff like this. I find it pretty creepy though, and if nothing else, I do think that Oda has very much succeeded in portraying a different sort of otaku to Bartolomeo, because Road is the kind of guy that we've all met, we know he's a bit off, and wouldn't be surprised to find out that he's keeping humans in his roleplay dungeon, which is an actual dungeon by the way. This was an old prison cell for giants, so that is an added layer of creepiness here. And at the moment, Road's giving me those archy vibes, but combined with a hint of the morbid artistry of Little Garden Galdino. Because our Road, he is a storyteller. He's very exciting that something organic and rather epic is happening in his diorama. And he really is verging on the delusion of God. Having mentioned Archie and Galdino, I also see a lot of NL in Road because his view of humanity is so low that he justifies them being his playthings. And I wouldn't be surprised if this Sun God business isn't just for show and Road actually believes himself to be the God of his own personal world here. There's definitely something not quite right with this boy. However, it was very satisfying to see him get struck by Nami at the end of the chapter. And I actually don't think that the art does the scale of this attack justice. What Nami did here was call down an NL size blast, and it was incredible. It was also the best possible solution for Oda, because revealing the Sun God to be Road is a bit underwhelming to say the least, because you immediately know that he's not a real threat. Luffy took down his Captain Haridin using just Gear's second Andres Rosa, so Road was never going to be threatening to Luffy, let alone a full monster trio. However, it is a great opportunity to showcase Nami. Road's not a threat to Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, but being able to fight a giant is a huge achievement for Nami. And this may be the same old wishful thinking as always, but I'm wondering if Usopp is watching this and thinking to himself, damn, even Nami can fight giants now? I gotta get this long nose out of my butt and onto the battlefield. To be completely fair, Usopp had a great moment in this chapter as well. His skull bomb grasp was colossal, on an even bigger scale than Nami's thunder, actually. It just, uh, <laughs> it didn't really do anything. But this was a very strong Nami chapter because there was also that moment where she instantly memorized the map of Legoland and just threw it away, which I appreciated because Nami's dream feels like it's gotten a bit lost over time. We almost never focus on drawing maps or even Nami's skill with reading and absorbing maps. So this was one of those moments where we see a childhood of slaving over making thousands of maps for Arlong coming back to help us. And also I should mention that Rode is the navigator of the new giant warrior pirates. So what we have in this chapter is a very rare navigator v navigator matchup. And in the end, I think Luffy's judgment of the situation tells me that this is probably just going to be taken as a fun little side quest. Ah, <laughs> Road, he's a strange man, but whatever. Because as odd as he comes off, Luffy doesn't seem overly concerned with anything that's happening here. And he even had that moment of asking Iscat to be more careful about not destroying the diorama because he could see that Road had put a lot of work into it. More importantly, we finally have an explanation for that Gear 4 error, which is no longer an error. It was intentional. It would appear that Luffy has evolved once more and that he can now use Gear Force techniques in select parts of his body without having to assume the full form, which I have to admit looked pretty damn cool in the way that he used it in this chapter. The only thing I feel is a bit of a shame is that with this power, there's now never really any reason to use Gear 3rd again. It's a completely defunct gear now, because Gear 4th can do everything it can just better and at seemingly no cost. But then again, I do really appreciate the idea of evolution and the concept of, yeah, it's okay to retire techniques, especially over such a long running series. Because this is the thought I have every time Goku uses a Kamehameha again. Because it's like, mate, you've been using the same attack for almost genuinely half a century now, and it hasn't scaled very well. Use other things, you got other things. And with Luffy, this all goes back to his general idea of freedom. After accessing Gear 5th, his Devil Fruit has awakened. And I like that we're seeing that trickle down to the fruit as a whole rather than just Gear 5th. Luffy now has more freedom than ever before with all of his attacks. He's becoming more efficient, more versatile, and he's having the time of his life whilst doing it. And at the end of this chapter, we have Luffy using his little Gear 4th 
to bust through a wall designed to hold giants. So that's pretty cool. And I think it's Usopp who's praying and says, please be Elbaf on the outside, which I think very much encapsulates the voices of the fans at the moment. What we're doing here, it's fun and all. And I have no doubt that these chapters are going to be great to blast through in a volume format, but I really am getting that Elbaf itch. And with the kind of meh reveal of who the false sun god actually is, the amount of time that I want to keep spending in the diorama world is pretty much zero. So here's hoping that our adventure will begin in earnest next week. And thanks so much again to Sea of Conquest for sponsoring this video and allowing us to bring you the best fictional pirate content possible as often as possible. Definitely check them out through the link in the description.